more and more of God's grace, his mercy, his love, his peace, his hope. Fill your hearts and your minds this day. May we, may we with the disciples say as we leave today and have seen Jesus, my Lord and my God, I do believe. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, amen. There's really no other experience for worship quite like Easter, is there? Carried along by a full house of joyous believers, surrounded by the sweet aroma of flowers, inspired by music and preaching, sent on our way by our joyous Easter song. We go to our family Easter celebrations with Easter proclamations still ringing in our ears. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. How different. How different that picture is from the Easter uh, evening scene that John paints for us in the gospel we heard read for us today. Where Jesus' disciples have gathered in a safe house in Jerusalem. Hiding from the Jews. Huddled together behind locked doors, cowering, John says, for fear of the Jews. These men who had been closest to Jesus gave no indication that they in any way believed that he was risen from the dead. And they certainly weren't shout any, shouting any words to that effect that night. They could think only of themselves. Think only of the dangers that they faced because they were companions of Jesus. And they were very frightened. It's, pre it's pretty obvious that Thomas wasn't the only doubter that we met in that story today. However, we shall discover that the heart of their problem went much deeper than just doubt. For it was not doubt that left them paralyzed in fear that night. It was unbelief that gripped their hearts. Why were they afraid of the Jews? It was because they were the people who had the power that symbolized death to them. Death for their beloved rabbi and potential death for themselves if they were identified as his companions. If their hearts were still ruled by the earthly powers of death, what could they do except be afraid? It was unbelief that filled their hearts. But then how different are we who would be his disciples today? Even after we have heard and proclaimed that God was raised, that God raised Jesus from the grave and conquered death. Even after that, how many of us don't find ourselves sometimes locked behind closed doors of our fears? Fears of lost jobs and shrinking retirement accounts. Fears of terrorists and hostile nations. Fears of those who are different than we are by appearance or by politics or by religion. Fears of illness and dying. Our anxious, fearful lives betray us. <coughs> the powers of death hold us captive as powerfully as they did Jesus' disciples on that Easter night. But if Jesus had been raised, why were the disciples so afraid? Fear was their companion because they didn't believe the reports of the women who told of the resurrection. They didn't believe their reports any more than Thomas was going to believe theirs. And like Thomas, before they could believe in any resurrection, they wanted physical proof. They wanted to see a resuscitated body. They wanted to see the wounds in his hands and the, and the wound in his side still fresh from his passion, there for them to reach out and touch. 
Unbelievers today may not be so literal in seeking proof of a living God to take away their fears. They might not say, well, they need to be able to touch Jesus. They're more likely to couch their unbelief in phrases like, I'm just not that interested in God. I don't really need him that much in my life. Or they might say things like, I'm doing fine without spending a lot of time thinking about Jesus. Or they might just say, ah, going to church doesn't do all that much for me. In essence, all who speak those kind of words are echoing Thomas who said, unless I get overwhelming proof, unless I know it makes a difference in my lives, I won't believe. The truth is that Thomas and his friends trusted the certainty of death more than the promise of the resurrection. After all, they thought, death was a known quantity for them. They knew and believed in death. They'd seen it enough times when people that they were close to or part of their lives had died. Did they have, really have any reason to expect that it was going to be any different for Jesus? After all, they'd seen his battered body removed from the cross, wrapped in cloths, laid in a tomb, and he looked just as dead to them then as any other person that they had seen who had died. Indeed, the problem for Thomas and his friends was much deeper than doubt. Their real problem was unbelief. To put it another way, they placed their faith in the wrong places. Rather than trusting God and his promises, their faith in Jesus was pushed out by the certainty of death as they had experienced it. Certainty that filled them with fear and caused them to hide. In truth, their unbelief centered not so much in whether or not Jesus really had come back from the dead, but whether they could let go of any of these other lords which had grown in their lives, lords of death that filled them with fear and would keep them locked out of any future except judgment and eternal death. How serious is such unbelief? John tells us how serious it is in the last verses that end this reading we heard today. Those who believe, John says, have life in Jesus' name. Those who don't are stuck with death. And the final, as the final word, those who don't believe are stuck in lives of fear and trouble and despair. That's why John says he wrote his gospel to share the good news with all who would read it, that Jesus broke into the realm of death when he took our death sentence upon himself, and then he erased it from our future when God raised him to life on Easter morning. In that way, he was making it possible for all who believed to have life in his name. In the end, it was not seeing Jesus' wounds that transformed all those scared and hiding men into bold witnesses willing to risk their lives to tell the world about him. These same men who hid in that room that night would soon be out in the streets of Jerusalem and all through that part of the world saying that he was alive and had died for all people. What changed them was their faith in God. Their faith in God who brings life from death and who therefore has power over all of the principalities and powers that bring that kind of fear and anxiety into our lives. It was a faith that arose in them when the risen Christ broke into their fear-filled, peaceless lives. And everything changed for them. And he did it not by showing his disciples his wounds, he did it by simply standing before them. In the end, they didn't have to put their hands in his wounds. They simply saw him and things changed. Neither, neither they nor Thomas had to sink their hands into his hands or his side in order to get peace. They simply knew that now, because Jesus was alive and because he was with them, they didn't have to be afraid anymore. Jesus didn't have to wait for the disciples to first confess their unbelief and repent 
before he would promise to change them. He simply came and he said before them, peace be with you. He just came to them and offered them peace by his presence. And just his presence was enough to change them, to take away the fear and to give them that peace. The disciples believed and they couldn't wait to tell Thomas. And before long, they would be telling anyone else they could encounter. Thomas, for all of his hesitation, he had expressed, took one glance at Jesus. And he fell to his knees and said, my Lord and my God. His fear was gone. And tradition tells us that Thomas would one day go all the way to India to pass on this peace through the good news that he had experienced in Jesus. It was however more even than Jesus' presence and appearance that changed Thomas and the others. John, John tells us that as Jesus stood before them, he breathed on them his Holy Spirit. And it was the holy contagion of the Spirit that got into their bloodstreams. That's what changed them from reluctant and fearful observers of Jesus to bold and convincing witnesses of what God had done through him. The risen Christ is in our midst today, right here in this place. We, can put our, we can't put our hands in the wounds, but he's here in the precious words that we proclaim to one another. He's here in the supper that we will experience again in just a few moments as we eat and drink his body and blood given and shed for us. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. But it's not enough for us just to shout that out here. Jesus breathes into us his Holy Spirit as he did those disciples so that we might go from this place and be the witnesses to those, to others of what he has told us. And that believing we might have life in his name. A life that includes going to all those we know who live in fear. All those who are still locked behind the locked doors of their fears. And tell them there's one who offers them peace. One who has lived and died and rose back to life. So that they might know God's acceptance and forgiveness. And the one who's also gone ahead of them. To repair a place for them when this life ends. Thomas and his friends discovered that new identity as they knelt before the crucified and risen Lord that evening behind the closed doors in Jerusalem. No longer did they live for themselves. Now they changed their identity to children of God. And as the Holy Spirit took up residence in their lives, they were changed from scared, doubting people to brave people ready to stand up for Jesus anywhere. It's in the waters of baptism that you and I first met the risen Jesus, the crucified and risen Son of God. And whenever we look for Jesus, he's ready through his presence in our lives to use us to help others to find the same peace and the same hope in Jesus that we have found. Whenever we open ourselves to the spirit of that risen, crucified, and risen Lord. He enables us to live as his children in all that we do and are. That's our identity now and forever. Children of God who no longer are afraid or doubt, but who boldly trust that Jesus is there for us always. My friends, we come together in this place today. We come together from all of the fear-filled, door-locked places of our lives. We come here, and suddenly in the common substances of bread and wine, our risen Lord stands amongst us. And as he comes to us through that bread and wine, he breathes on us his Holy Spirit, and he says to us, Peace be with you. With Thomas, what else can we do but fall on our knees and gasp, my Lord and my God? Jesus breathes in us his peace. And the fears melt away. And we go forth from this place with that new identity, children of God, upheld by his peace, 
made bold to tell others what God has done with us here. Jesus says to you, peace be with you. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.